Now, having said that, let's come back home and look at a burning issue on a broader note, especially with the conduct of local government elections across states in Nigeria, be it in Enugu, be it in Benue, or in Rivers, with the latter proving even more volatile. There has been a widespread destruction to public infrastructure, with local government headquarters set ablaze. There's also been reportedly a death toll standing at five persons as of now. There have even been more stringent measures with the redeployment of the former Commissioner of Police in River State, CP Olutunji Bisu, and the reinstatement of a new Commissioner of Police. With all these telltale signs of some level of breakdown in law and order, we'll be joined by a security analyst and consultant on the show this morning as we look at the topic, curbing political uprisings. In our studio this morning, we're now joined by Dr. Steve Okori. Good morning to you, Doctor, and welcome to the program. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having me. Now, Dr. Wiles, we've looked at uh, the aftermath of local government election across states. Yeah. Uh, there have been some level of disquieting, a number of these states, but much would say always like has been a tradition. River State seems to be the most volatile. Now, there's been some shakeup in the security architecture of the states. The Commission of Police position now has been rejigged. We'll start with that as a main point of concern. Do you think that the redeployment of uh, CPO Lutunji Disu is somewhat of a loss of confidence, or do you think the reinstatement of this new CP is more of a no-nonsense approach to the situation in River State? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you for having me to uh, give my perspective on these uh, very serious issues that has been trending in the last couple of uh, days or weeks. Um, the redeployment of CP uh, Disu from uh, Rivers to FCT, I, I, I think, is uh, a routine exercise. You know, For many asking why FCT. No, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, the, the, it's at the discretion of the IGP to post, uh, redeploy, or appoint new commissioners of states. You know, so uh, Disu CP Disu is a professional. A, a professional that I know very well. You know, he was a commander of uh, the intelligence response uh, team, you know, IRT here in the FCT before he was made commissioner and posted to River State. And he did excellently well in River State. So I, I think it's just a, a normal uh, routine exercise that the police usually carries out, you know. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with... Uh, the political situation in, in Rivers. That's what That's I, your take on it? Yes, that's my take We'll on. also take a listen to comments made by the newly redeployed CP, CP Bala Mustafa in River State in the course of this conversation. But let's also come down to some of the comments made mm. by the FCT minister. Mm. Uh, speaking to my colleagues in an interview, he said that uh, he has loyalists in River States. And whilst people are alleging that it is his supporters who disgruntled over the election results moved to wreck the level of havoc we're seeing. He's saying that they did not do so under his bidding. Does that uh, disassociation somewhat renege his involvement in the trouble that has followed the election results? You see, um, the crisis, the political crisis in Rivers uh, started before now. It's, I think it's over a year that we've been experiencing one crisis or the other in River State. Uh, I, I don't want to believe or think that uh, the FCT minister will, will allow his uh, supporters or mobilize his supporters to go destroy uh, the reverse people's uh, property in that manner. You know, we saw situations where uh, about three of or so local government uh, secretariats were, were burnt down, you know. So uh, a, a, a right-thinking person, you know, and as a former governor of a state, of that very state, that we saw where they called him Mr. Project, why he was governor for eight years, you know, will not see that his supporters or support them into going to burn down uh, government properties. You see, uh, the issue is when two elephants fight, they say it's the ground that suffers. Now we have seen two political gladiators uh, a godfather and a godson, if you allow me to use the word, uh, because you and I know how the governor emerged as governor. You know, uh, 
wiki as governor then uh, try to see how to gag and uh, possibly see how to uh, other aspirants from uh, contesting for that same position you know and uh, if you ask me i think he single-handedly uh, imposed uh, the governor fubara on the party as in on pdp and at the end of the day he emerged as governor um, the ground that is offering now is the river state uh, uh, funds you know because the properties that have been destroyed of course they will be built back and with which resources will they use the resources taxpayers money exactly that they will use in building all these uh, structures that were burnt you know so it's the river state's uh, taxpayers money that will suffer it you know from what you just read you know, about five persons or so have lost their lives in the course of all this and all these things of situations we are seeing for me they are avoidable you know it's just a matter of both parties understanding the, the, the themselves you know where Amana the man emerged as governor I think it was between Wiki and him uh, nobody was there when Wiki invited him or called him to say come I want you to succeed me it must be it must have been a conversation between just the two of them now a whole lot of people are now making comments with regards to the situation in, the, in River State I I think that is the both of them are on, sitting on a high horse right where well, I'm seeing ego and uh, pride you know being displayed amongst the the two of them I made you governor yes I am now governor you don't have control over me you know and all that so I, I think the solution for me in this crisis that we are seeing is the way I manner the two of them sat and had this discussion okay you're going to succeed me it's also the same way that the that two of should them be resolved the two of just them, the two of just them. the two of them you know? Now, one person doesn't agree with you, and that person is the former APC governorship candidate in River State, Mr. Tony Cole. He has said other than two people, mm. four persons mm -hmm. should join them. He has mentioned former governor Peter Odili. He mm -hmm. has called on Amici as well. He has also called on President Bola Metinibu, who prior to now also orchestrated the signing of a peace pact. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. It didn't work. You know, so for me, I don't think there's any need for that crowd. For, because when it's beyond that too, it's now a crowd. That imagine the, the president of the country. I watched Nyoso uh, Wike uh, on channels TV yesterday, and he talked about the intervention of the president, the father of the nation. That was what, the word he used, and we didn't see that play out. There's, it didn't result to any peace. So I I want to believe that uh, Wike first of all made him an uh, accountant general of the state, right? And I <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I recall when. The, when he had some issues, uh, financial transactions that EFCC went after him, and VKST kept him in, in, in the government house also, and the EFCC officials couldn't have access to him, you know. So it means that the governor and the former governor, Wiki, they've come a long way, you know. For you to look at the political space and see that this is the person that you want to him to succeed you, it means that there's some kind of relationship. So what has happened to the relationship? You know, so I think that the two of them sit. We're not talking about weakness here, because when we came, I'm pretty sure that when we came first of all, you invited me to have this conversation with him that you're going to succeed me. There was nobody there. You know, it was when they had that conversation and they all there was an understanding, understanding and an agreement and you know parties. and all that and on, an unwritten agreement. You know, because such agreement you don't expect a pen and paper. You know, so after that conversation, I think that. There's need for the two of them to just this seat. What's the problem? Let us talk. And you know? now, Governor Similar Life Barry has told the press that mm. uh, he has countless of times mm. knelt down mm -hmm. and uh, he more like refers to him as his Oga mm -hmm. at the top mm. uh, to seek forgiveness over whatever misgivings it is. Mm. But many are saying that it is an unforgivable sin of trying to replace the political structures he inherited. Is there such thing as an unforgivable sin that even the kneel of a sitting go of a, of a incumbent governor on the floor cannot somehow beg for forgiveness from his godfather. I just the way I said I watched Wiki yesterday on TV and he refuted that that there was never a day or a time that the governor knelt down to, to beg him for anything or ask for forgiveness. You know, so these are two different people saying two different things. Who do we not believe? The governor said he knelt down. Wiki said yesterday on TV that he did. The governor never knelt down. That who is he for the governor to kneel down before him and all that? I, I think that the both of them are trying to play some kind of games, right? Uh, one is trying to see how to dominate the other, you know. 
But I think that it is important that there should be this understanding. Look at the catastrophe that this misunderstanding has caused the, the state, you know. So I think they allowed the crisis to degenerate to this level that we are seeing. Lives lost, properties destroyed, you know. For me, I, they, 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 I don't see them as lead, political leaders anymore. Because leaders, you sit and you see that properties that you are supposed to protect, you know, being destroyed. What legacy are you trying to leave for the younger generation that are coming after you, you know? Uh, politics is not this the way we are seeing it. It's not killings. It's not destruction of properties. It's, it's a game, you know. It's a game, and we expect that there should be a sportsmanship kind of, you know, where both everybody should be seen to be carried along, and the 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 development of the state and the lives of the citizens of uh, or indigents of rivers should be their priority, you know. So. I think that the both of them should come down from their high horse and look at how to resolve the issues. Now, Dr. Steve has preferred solutions he feels should be a resolution between the two men, a successor and his predecessor behind closed doors, much like they had when the agreement was broke out for a succession to take place. Now, following the redeployment of former Commissioner of Police Olutunji Bisu to the FCT, a new CP has been redeployed to River State in CP Bala Mustafa. Now, CP Bala Mustafa, on assuming office at the River State Command yesterday, has vowed to take a tough stance against criminal activities and ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice, particularly those who set fire to local government headquarters in River State. He has also emphasized on the importance of collaborations between law enforcement and the community in maintaining peace and order in River States. Let's take a listen to CP Bala Mustafa speaking. Our priority is to ensure the safety and security of, and well-being of all residents and visitors of the River State as a state. To address the security challenges and ensure that no abiding citizen go about their lawful business. I am aware that River State, being one of the nation's economic hubs, faces unique security challenges from incidents of kidnapping, autism, and robbery, and road working to communal clashes and other violent crimes. And more, more recently, uh, issues. Emanating issues emanating from political interest. Now, CP Mustafa has talked about neutrality and refraining from having any political interest come to play in River State. But more importantly, mm -hmm. he has talked about creating an atmosphere for Rivers people to resume back their businesses in an atmosphere of peace. Mm -hmm. right? It almost seems as if uh, the trouble we saw yesterday is dying down following all these moves. How commendable is this? Yeah, you know. Uh, one of the mandates of the police is to see that there's um, peace and order, you know, and also prevent uh, crime, you know, and also detection of uh, crime. These are mandates of uh, the police force. So a situation where there is uh, anarchy, where there's public disturbance of uh, public peace, and uh, what we saw uh, in Prairie Rivers, the police responsibilities now is to see that uh, peace is restored, you know, and normalcy is also restored. Everybody goes about their lawful businesses, you know, without hindrance and all that. Now, beyond that, I, I think that um, the new commissioner of police, one of his responsibilities now is to see that he, he invites uh, critical stakeholders in the state, political, because what we are seeing now in Rivers is, is political crisis, right? So he, he would need to invite uh, critical stakeholders for a, a stakeholders meeting, right? Uh, the both parties. He invites, he extends invitation to the minister of the FCT and uh, also to the governor. It's not a meeting for me that should hold in the government house. You know, the, the, the CP should look out for a neutral uh, venue, perhaps even with, uh, at the state command there. We should have a conference hall or something where people can come and sit and have these discussions. You know, so at this point, I think that is what the commissioner of police should think of doing: invite these uh, political gladiators and other 
people that they expect, like the Peter Odili, Rutmi Amechi, all these political leaders in the state. I'm new. This is the situation. Now. Because the, the handing over report that was given to him by the immediate past CP must contain in this report the crisis in the rivers. So one of the things that this new CP should address is that, you know, so that normalcy should return uh, the way river state used to be. So a meeting of stakeholders, religious leaders, some traditional rulers and all that must be part of that meeting, you know, so that they can have this conversation and see how to put a stop to it. Now also to complement this peace resolution efforts, yeah. the governor Sassimina Life Obara has also constituted a seven-man justice panel to probe the incidents. Yeah. Uh, many Nigerians are of the opinion that it might just be a mere ritual People are doubting the capability of the new CP mm -hmm. and the complementing efforts of this panel to actually bring to book the arsonists, the mm -hmm. political thugs who many say were not behind masks when they carried out these dastardly acts. Yeah, we saw them on TV. The videos, if you if they can play the videos and you see the actual perpetrators of this uh, uh, criminal uh, act, you know. So, yeah, uh, administratively, I think is a way to go set up a, a, a panel of inquiry, you know so that they can come up with. I think I heard the governor reading out um, uh, the mandate of the panel, you know. They should look at the level of damage done and all that, and some individuals that were uh, personally affected, you know, the compensation level or rate that should be given or accorded to them, you know. So I, I think it's not a, a wrong thing to do, you know. And a, and a dispositive of in, panel of inquiry should be in place to come up with all that, you know. And we we'll, we'll have to give them that benefit of a doubt. We shouldn't begin to doubt the outcome or their capacity, you know. Even this new CP that is there is a professional. For the IGP to see the uh, appoint, yeah, it means that he, he knows his capacity, you know, and his capability. So all these, I think they are in place to see how to see that peace comes to rivers. And... Uh, for me, it's a way to go. Uh, there's nothing wrong in carrying out all these, uh, uh, these activities that the governor and the, the, uh, the cross the um, CP has, the plans that they have. So let us just hold on a bit and see the outcome you know, of all these that they have in place. Now, there's a challenge with where this issue and breakdown in law and order started from. Many would remember the issue with the National Assembly Complex in River State. But most recently, the comments have been on local government elections. Yes. Now, whilst in River State, the situation is on what constitutes obedience for the rule of law. Mm. The FCT minister speaking yesterday, which we listened to, talked about two persons. First, he accused uh, the presidential candidate of the PDP, former VP Atiku Abu Bakr, of encouraging the governor to disobey the rule of law. Mm. And many are asking disobedience in what aspect, especially mm. with the 90-day window given to states to conduct their elections. Mm. Hence, they would not receive any payments in terms of federal allocation. Yeah. Uh, what do you understand by this supposed disobedience for court judgments? Now, there was, first of all, a judgment from the River State High Court, right? For, because we've been following events. And uh, the judgment from the River State High Court gave uh, the River State Electoral uh, Commission uh, go ahead, a nod, to go ahead, to conduct the local government election. And they asked that INEC should release uh, the voters' uh, register. register. Now, the other party now approached the, the Federal High Court and uh, they got a judgment from Federal High Court that the processes that is heading that was heading towards the conduct of the local government election were on a faulty ground, right? And they approached the federal high court. And uh, from from my findings, the, the the state high court does not have jurisdiction to superintend over federal agencies of government, right? And that was why the parties that now went to the federal high court deemed it fit that okay they best place to go is the Federal High Court, which had authority or has authority over the Nigerian police, which is a federal agency and, and the, the 
Independent National Electoral Commission, which is also a federal agency of government. At the end of it all, both parties were represented by their lawyers and all that. And you see, it depends. All this now happened based on the arguments of both uh, the lawyers or the representative of these uh, parties. And at the end of the day, there was this judgment by, from the Federal High Court that the election should not hold until the ideal thing or the proper things are done. And in the event where the election must go on, uh, the police should not uh, provide security, which is an order of court, right? And the INEC should not provide a voters register. voters register. Now, when you begin to look at it, there was no order from the first court, that's the River State High Court, where they gave an order or whatever that the police should provide security. And with that, with that I expect that anybody on the other side that wasn't comfortable with the outcome of the Federal High Court, there was an opportunity or a legal grace to approach the appeal court to see how to obtain the decision of the Federal High Court, which is the, the ideal thing to do, if, if you ask me. I am sitting here saying the way I think it should it be. Should. I don't belong to any of the parties, right? So if you are not comfortable with the judgment of the Federal High Court, you appeal. And of course, the, the courts, they are aware of the of the issues on ground. So there will be this quick dispensation, you know, of the processes. Especially in regards to the 90 days yeah, window as provided. Well exactly. So it's not an issue where the court will now begin to sit on the matter to see that it's being dragged or delayed for a period of time. But according to the information I heard, there was an appeal from the parties that were not uh, giving judgment at the Federal High Court. Now, the police, we have seen situations where uh, agencies of government don't comply or obey court orders, right? Uh, we've heard those cries from lawyers, from individuals talking about non-compliance of court orders. Now the police under the current IGP have decided to obey a court order. And for me, if the, the, the police is not being partisan, because it was an order from court that they should not provide until the ideal team, whatever the issues are, or that were raised in the court during the, the, the processes and all that. Now, the police had decided to comply. Now, people are taking on the IGP, asking that uh, he failed in his constitutional responsibility. Some people are saying that he should resign and all that. In the event where the IGP refused to obey the order of court and went ahead to provide security, would that be a content of a uh, court? You know? So they shouldn't put the IGP in a... In a in a, in a situation where he will be between the devil and the, the deep uh, blue sea, you know, there was another, and there was no any other superior order or judgment that vacated uh, that of the Federal High Court, you know. So what do you expect the IGP to do? The IGP is to see that he complies with the order of the court until both parties see how to resolve themselves, and the ideal thing is done, and the police will go ahead to provide security. You know, so when I hear people asking that or saying that the IGP ought to have resigned, they have failed in providing security for the rivers people and all that. When there was already an order, they failed to look at that part, and they are not even condemning whatever. For instance, talking about the judge, that or the justice that passed that or gave that order. So for me, the IG is innocent in this matter. You know, there was an order before the issues of uh, the local government election. The IGP provided security for the local government secretariat because. You are aware that police were, de de were deployed to pro provide security for the sec secretariat, right? When they now conducted the local government election and the new chairman were sworn in, the IGP now said, okay, police that were providing security, withdraw and go back to other duties. Other duties. And uh, lo and behold, look at the mayhem that uh, came on the local government secretary that were burnt down. So I, I, I think that... Uh, we should be looking to at the things the way they are and begin to give our perspective or our narratives based on the way we see the issues. Speaking and to issues on facts. That's the it. Facts that yeah, we should not take position or begin to speak on the on the basis of sentiment or emotions and all that. And even when the IG, when the court gave that order, I watched the governor on TV where he said, if the IGP does not provide security, that the river state or the river people will provide their own security. And look at the situation where we are now. There were no police to see how to stop these guys when there they There was came. also no NSCDC, which was a concern as well. Yeah. NSCDC, you see, these issues are, their, their mandates are clear. 
some of these these local government uh, secretariats are also critical government uh, infrastructures. And one of the part of the mandate of the NS, NSCDC is to see that they provide security for government infrastructures. So they were not seen anywhere. So what's the River State uh, Command of the NSCDC? What are they doing in the event where the police were given an order not to provide security? Were they also given that same order? Now, there's also another issue on credibility of the elections. Another accusation coming in from the camp of supporters of uh, the FCT minister is accusing the current governor, Similai Fubara, of anti-party activities. Mm. A lot of persons are saying he outrightly sponsored the APP, and with such a landslide victory, mm. the credibility of the election should be called into question. Do you agree? I, there's no local government election that has a credibility anywhere in the, in the country. Even in my state in Benue, they had the same local government election that same day, 5th of October. And uh, people... You also saw the landslide victory as well. Yes, the 23 local government all won by APC. You know, so you see, until the National Assembly goes ahead to amend certain laws in our constitution that has to do with lo uh, local government. Yes, the courts, the Supreme Court have done something very wonderful, marvelous, where the local government have autonomy, they are resources, or allocation goes straight to the local government. Now, I expect that the National Assembly should abolish that part of the Constitution where they talk about joint account committee. You know, that is still there. You know, until that portion is expunged, you know, then we'll begin to see that real autonomy. You know, I think the, the National Assembly has failed to take cognizance of that portion of the Constitution. So they need to see how to amend the Constitution and take away that jack, joint account committee. You know, so that the local government and the state will no longer have that committee where they begin to discuss about uh, finance. That is one. Then two, the National Assembly should see that local government elections are taken care of by the federal INEC. You know, because it is not possible you see a state like Anambra State where they don't have any senator, Abga does not have any senator, Abga, out of the nine or ten federal House of Rep members, Abga has just one or two or so. At the end of the day, local government election was conducted in Anambra State, and Abga won the whole local government, uh, the 19 local governments in Anambra State. And it's applicable to other states. Where is PDP? Everybody is, uh, all the chairmen that wins are PDP. Where is APC? All the chairmen that wins are APC. It was only in Akwaibo. They also had their own local government election on the 5th of October as well. It was only in Akwaibom where, out of the 31 local governments, one. 30 PDP won, 1 APC won. And <laughs> surprisingly, a chieftain of the APC, by name uh, Etim Etim or so, went and uh, met the governor and uh, was thanking the governor for allowing... Did you hear that? That was the statement he made. It was, yes. published, it, had, it, it was televised as well. Yes, the, for allowing... So it means that it wasn't the people that voted for the chairman that won, the APC candidate that won now, that thanking the governor for allowing the local government to be taken by APC, by uh, stopping to embarrass the Senate president because the local government belongs to the Senate president or the Senate president is from that, uh, that local government. Why would he make such a statement in a democracy? People came out. I know that the Senate President, because that is his local government, he has the capacity to mobilize his people, talk to them, win their hearts, to come out and vote for the candidate of the APC. So why would the chieftain of the APC go and say that, thanking the governor Almost for... Almost like ridiculing the credibility of exactly, the Exactly. For allowing. It doesn't make any sense to me. So when we see all this and we hear all this, then we begin to ask questions that, do we truly... Is the state independent uh, electoral commission, are they truly independent? But it's because we are seeing some kind of uh, 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 independence at the federal INEC. You understand? So the state independent, they are not independent. The, the, now they have, uh, uh, what do you call it now, formed or uh, put panels in place. Who, 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 the panels will do the bidding of who? The bidding of the governor. So if you are aggrieved and uh, you are a loser of a, of, a, for, of a chairmanship election, you go, you go and approach the panel that you are coming to submit uh, uh, whatever to them. Will they listen to you when the panel was constituted by the state government? You know? So 
We should not make caricature of this whole situation, right? Let the National Assembly see that elections at the state, local government elections, are conducted by the federal INEC. With that, we can have some, some independence where somebody can come contest and win based on his popularity, you know? Because, we, for instance, in my state, my own local government, 10 persons bought the chairmanship election form close to about 6 million, 5.7 million or so, 10 persons. But meanwhile, they had already anointed one person to be, and there was no primaries. There was no primaries within the party for the person to emerge as governor, as a chairman, candidate, as candidate. candidate. Yes, there were no primaries. At the end of the day, the state came and conducted local government election. There was no election. And people were declared winners and sworn in, and the governor would sit and was commending the process. It almost feels like a selection process. That's it. Every All the states, is selection. It is selection. They select the names and give to the, the state and say, these are the winners before the election was conducted. We can't have a situation like that. And we say, we are, we are practicing a democracy where is government by Jeff, John uh, F. Kennedy, uh, uh, democracy, government of the people, by the people. So which were the people who came out to vote? They didn't, nobody came out to vote. So it was a selection process. It's still not an election. So why do we have governors of states that are supposed to be seen as leaders that should lead by example, where followers of, of the states will be seeing them as mentors? You know, the man is doing the right thing. But we, we don't see such situation. They are all not doing the right thing. They're not doing the right thing. So I do have, and you swore that you uh, obey, comply, X, Y, Z, and all that. At the end of the day, you're not doing the right thing. Now, Senator Natasha Akpoti has also lent her voice to this conversation. She's coming from the angle of the wider implications and how, how much of a threat this situation across local governments is a national security threat, in her words. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it has that widespread impact of becoming a national security threat? Obviously. Why not? This is a third tier of government, you know. It can, crisis at the local government level can degenerate to any level. And of course, you are aware that we don't even have enough security presence at the, at the local government level. Before the, the, the police or the other law enforcement agents will begin to see how to deploy or send uh, reinforcement to see how to go and support the, the very small number of, uh, of, uh, of personnel that we have at the local government, the damage is done. And of course, you know that when these issues happen, they can spread to possibly other local governments and even to other states. So I think it's a, it's a worrisome thing and uh, it's something that should be seen and try to seem to be tackled at the national level, you know, because we can't, we can't operate like this. We can't function like this. At the end of the day, they say it's a Nigerian factor. What is Nigerian factor? Doing the wrong thing is a Nigerian factor, you know? So I, I, I think when... Uh, People come out, campaign, uh, try to see the, win the hearts of voters and the likes. And at the end of the day, they are voted. Let us see that people come out to vote. We have, under the federal INEC, we saw somebody won a House of Reps seat under APGA from Taraba. Somebody won under APGA from Benue. Somebody will win election under a very strange party, you know, a, a a non-familiar party, and the person will win under INEC because the ideal thing was done. People came out and they voted for the candidate of their choice, and those votes were counted. You know, so let, let us have situation like that. And when we have it mixed, other political parties also win the position of chairman. The governor at the center will not have, you know, because he will see them as opposing uh, forces. You know, so he will be hair bent on doing the right thing, you know. But now, right now, you have all the people that you have selected, they have become chairman. At the end of the day, when the money still goes to the local government, even as it goes straight to the local government accounts, the governor still has the opportunity, you know, to say, out of what has come to you, because it's usually published, the amount that goes to every local government. Once it's published and the governor sees that, okay, to my local government is about 300 million that has come there. Okay, I'm aware that 300 million came to your local government. Out of the 300 million, We'll look out for a way to see that you remit like 150 million out of the 300 million. 
because the chairman was elected, he wasn't elected, right? His he, loyalty is still live with the governor. Absolutely. His loyalty is live to the, to the governor. So he will do the bidding of the governor. Otherwise, the status of assembly is there. Once the governor submits a, a petition against the chairman, the next thing they of course, you know the state assemblies are rubber stamped. They will sit down, come up with one uh, form of allegation or the other. The next thing, the chairman is suspended. So the chairman will as well go ahead to do, still do the biddings of the governors. Right. But in the event where it's an APC state and the, one of the chairmen is a PDP or Labour, right? You can't tell me to remit a hundred and fifty million out of my three hundred million that got to me to, for me to use to develop my own uh, local government. Now, logically speaking, on this issue of development, yeah. the allocation of funds is supposed to spur development, mm -hmm. but it's coming at a time when there is this yearning by different regions for their development commissions. Yeah. Now, how do we adjudge the intentionality for having special development commissions in certain regions when? This development that we seek at the 30th of government is supposed to be sourced from the federal go government's purse. Now, it's of the concern that some of these commissions would still have staff to be catered for. Mm. They would still have special duties and functions. And at some point, a duplication of function might occur between the development commissions in regions and the functions of local governments in such regions. Yeah. Do you think that this clash of interest at some point away from the, the stronghold of governors, mm. might also become another huge challenge in this endless tussle for power. No, no, I, I don't think it will be, it will raise any issue. Do you know why? Because the development commissions that we have, we have the Northeast, the South, South and all that. Now, it's for a synergy to be established between the development commission and the local government chairman. You understand? Okay, right now, we we'll have XYZ project. What you see, they sit down with the chairman, right? Now, the chairman also has his own kind of project that he wants to put up. Now, in, to avoid duplication, just the way you said. Now, if uh, the development commission wants to go and perhaps uh, renovate a particular primary school or a secondary school, and the local government also has that in their own agenda, it's rather than going to do that, there are other schools. Now, in our own agenda, we'll have XYZ school also to renovate or to build. The Development Commission will now see how to... So, the whole idea is for them to see how to work together. In synergy. I, yes, in synergy. Because I watched when Wiki was governor of Rivers. He was complaining about the South-South Development Commission. No, the, the, what do you call that? Thing NDDC. Now? NDDC. The NDDC has projects. NDDC will come to his state and begin to carry out these projects without even approaching him. Your Excellency, we have this XYZ project. Where do we think that we should, uh, you know, carry on? So there's that synergy. That gap causes a lot of things. So once that synergy is established, there won't be duplication. They will be working together. Because the whole idea is to see that the regions are developed, the local government within these regions and the states are also developed, you know. So... It is not something that an agency of government wants to begin to see that, okay, yes, it is our agency, it is our commission, and we must see that they work together. Because the whole idea, anybody that finds he or herself in a position of government, the idea is to see that the government or the state is... Is functional and the dividends of democracy can reach a descendant person. Absolutely. Now, the challenge now, as it were, is also a debate on the floor of the National Assembly uh, among some of the submissions and prayers is the renaming of the NEDC to accommodate other states that are not within the region but uh, have the title of oil producing states, particularly mm. Middle Belt, northern states where oil has now been discovered. Yeah. Now, in terms of the concept of development commissions, mm. such states will now fall outside such development commissions but are now supposed to be a part of whatever yeah. new nomenclature is given to the NEDC. Mm. Do you think this would also in some way complement the efforts of the National Assembly for that federal character principle to be seen to be working in the Nigerian state? Yes. Now, NDDC is a commission for states that produces oil, right? So if they discover oil in Bruno state, for instance, automatically Bruno comes under the NDDC. 
there are some financial benefits that goes to each state that they allocate according to the percentage. I don't know how they do it, but there are some percentage that goes to these oil producing states. The derivation from yes, them. Yes, yes, yes. So in the event where a state discovers oil, you know, automatically once NNPC and the relevant stakeholders discover that yes, the oil is truly there and it can it can be drilled and all that, and it also forms part of the federal revenue. Eh? Such states should also be included. Yes, in the NDDC. So I don't think that the NDDC has anything to do with uh, the South South Development Commission. These are two different uh, uh, agencies or commissions of government. South South, there are benefits that comes under the South South Development Commission. So as a South South state, and also a South South state that is under the NDDC, it's God has done it for you. <laughs> now, uh, Doctor, <laughs> there's a challenge with... Uh transparency as well yeah now whilst there's different monies from the federation accounts from the oil derivation to states uh, from the development commission is supposed to better the lots of the people there's also a challenge with uh, the what i call them anti-graft agencies or units of governments made to monitor and evaluate such performances the fcc and the nfiu this morning uh were captured in a suit by 16 states mm. who are asking the supreme court to Render the SEC unconstitutional, mm. owing to the provisions in our constitution for its establishment. Some concerned Nigerians are worried that without the NFIU and EFCC, who would be able to keep states in check, mm -hmm. and now more so, local government chairmen in check because mm. there's in increased allocation, increased FEC, but in terms of evident projects justifying this increased allocation, there seems to be a lack of balance in reports. Mm. Those 16 states, right? For me, they are enemies of the state. Really, because what is, what's their intention? We know a whole lot that the N EFCC are doing and the NFIU. Beyond uh, uh, arresting former governors or political politicians and all that to come and uh, answer questions to resources that were that they were allegedly uh, seen to... Yeah, or mismanaged. But there's a whole lot TFCC does and NFIU. Beyond that, we're talking about uh, uh, terrorism financing here, right? The FCC, they also have roles to play in trying to see how to counter terrorism financing. So if they have that kind of selfish or biased mind for their own interests, they are asking that ESCC should go off and forgetting the other roles that ESCC plays. ESCC will not come and tell them that this is what we are doing in the area of uh, countering terror financing. This is the, these are other things that we are doing in the area of uh, uh, ransom payment as a result of kidnapping. NFIU also has serious roles to play in the area of countering uh, terrorism financing. And you, as a state, you are asking that uh, such agencies should be scrapped. So I think they are enemies of the state, seriously. Because a well-thinking state, whoever that is thinking in that regard or in that direction, doesn't mean well for the state. Seriously. Now, there's also a case with the EFCC as well in terms of its management of its own funds. Mm. The states are also asking that if the EFCC is also to touch like them, the EFCC also needs an agency of government to also <laughs> probe it in terms of the management of its own funds. Yes, there's nothing wrong with that. Because uh, we have seen where ESCC recovers a whole lot of funds, right? Uh, uh, in the event where they recover such funds, what happens to those funds? There's nothing wrong with that, you know? So the National Assembly, you know, should begin to see how to tinker around coming up with something, you know, that should also put their searchlight on the ESCC as well, you know, because, uh, you know, in every system, there are badges. There are badges even in the AFCC. The fact that they are saddled with the responsibilities of trying to see that uh, uh, mis misuse of funds by politicians or any other person that is there uh, are checked. They also have reasons for them to be also be checked, right? So that we will see that the funds that they recover, what happens to those funds? I know that when they get to the courts of law, for future of such funds is at the at that level 
I think it's the court handles such funds, you know. But there are these personal ones that they recover even outside uh, the court. What happens to uh, those funds? So something needs to be done in that regard. I I, I think I, I will have to go with them in that uh, regard. But asking that uh, the SEC should be scrapped or for whatever reasons that they are given, I don't think is the best for the country at the moment. Even the fact that they, they see them as being uh, the witch hunt uh, political opponents or whatever, it doesn't matter. These people truly take out, take this money away. We saw the Tarabak state governor and all that, and uh, a whole lot of them. You know, but I, I think they need the, gov the support of government to see that they do their work, you know, and you know, so that they don't begin to think otherwise, you know, because these politicians, they have uh, access to public funds. In the event where they make this uh, offer, you know, don't forget that the EFCC officials are, first of all, human beings and Nigerians before they started working in the EFCC. So some of them are tempted. You know, so government needs to see that they put them in a position where, you know, they can serve with integrity and patriotism. Now, one of the states, in particular out of the 16 Kogi states, mm. in their suit, they are outrightly requesting for one thing. They're mm. requesting that the power to arrest be scrapped from the EFCC if the EFCC cannot be entirely scrapped. Why? They are citing the incident that occurred at the government's lodge here in the FCT as uh, one of the case studies as to why the EFCC's power of making arrests should be scrapped. That's why it's a commission. Why should they take out the powers to arrest? And that is why a lot of us are asking for electoral amendments electoral amendment so that we can see that uh, INEC has an, an electoral offenders commission as well, you know, so that they can also have powers to arrest, you know, because the food soldiers or the perpetrators of political thuggery, you know, they, are, they have sponsors and the sponsors are these political politicians that are there, you know. So INEC cannot begin to see how to go and take a, a former governor or a commissioner and all that. So once there's a commissioner as well, just the way we have the, the EFCC, they will also have the powers to arrest. And with that, we can begin to see that our democracy is properly in place, right? EFCC, there's nothing wrong with the powers that they have. You know, why are you running away from being arrested if you know that you are clean? The allegations are against you, yes. I saw the Taraba governor, they... They invited him, he was in court, and they granted him bail. So why is the governor of Kogi, former governor of Kogi, refusing arrest? Why must there be some kind of sin, you know, each time they go after him and all that? So uh, for me, of course, you know that the intention of the Kogi state government, you know, trying to see that uh, they take out the power of arrest, there's a, a, a political undertone. Of course, it's as a result of uh, Yahya Bello's uh, issue. Now, in closing, as we look to conclude on our topic, curbing political uprising, many are saying that the powers rest with political state actors mm. and that one of the rituals, or should I call it ceremonies before elections, should have more of a symbolic value than just a paper signing. Mm. And that is speaking to issues of the peace accord. Now, they say if we're coming to the field to ask for votes, and we're coming with the mindset that the results will be treated with such reactions, then the position of the peace accord needs to be reevaluated. In reevaluating this, what are some of your thoughts as to how political actors can enshrine the basic significance of this peace accord even post elections? <laughs> yeah, the peace accord issue. If if you confront Obasikina, you hear a different story about the peace accord. And that was the reason why he, you know, they didn't sign it. I don't know if they eventually signed at the end of the day. But the fact is, I've listened to Father Kuka, how the Peace Commission even came about, you know. He gave us a background to eat and all that. And uh, the Peace Accord is not a constitutional thing. It's just a moral, a moral thing. It's, it's not a must that somebody must sign, you know. And... With that, it doesn't give you that uh, weight that uh, one expects, you know. So I, I think that um, the government should try and see what to do around that, where when political leaders or candidates of parties come up to sign the peace accord, we should see that the, there's a genuineness. It's not just for the, for the purpose of signing sake. Let me just append my signature and just get out. Uh, 
we are going to take it by force, we are going to do all that and all that, all that. Let it go beyond just that mere ceremony, you know. Let it, let us see that there's some kind of, they should try and see, and see how to improve on it, try to give it some kind of legal, you know, upgrade it to see that it has some kind of legal tendencies where people should be seen to be compelled you to know, keep peace despite to, the outcome of the election despite the outcome of the election look at what is happening in uh, Edo. a lot of protests on the streets and all that you know there's a, already an avenue where grievances can be channeled first there will be a tribunal after the tribunal there will be an appeal and after the appeal there will be supreme right so these are legal avenues where grievances can be channeled. And I call on our political gladiators or political actors, especially in those states now. They can call up, call on those their supporters and tell them that go and go about your lawful businesses. We are approaching the legal way to see how to recover our mandate because the way they, were, they said they, their, their mandate has been stolen. Let them see how to uh, recover the stolen mandate. There's a tribunal. If you're not comfortable with the outcome of the tribunal, for instance, you are going on appeal. And there's this independence in our judiciary, whether we like it or not. If a judgment favors you, glory be to God. If a judgment does not favor you, it's not for you to begin to see how to talk down on the judiciary, saying that uh, uh, it's the kangaroo judgment, and they're saying all those sorts of, using those kind of uh, abnormal words. You know, we have seen where judiciary removed a, a, a ruling party and brought in the, the opposition party. We have seen situations where things turn around, you know. So I think that we should have confidence in the judiciary, you know, and follow the legal process. And uh, I think with that, the outcome, we'll see it at the end of the tunnel. Well, must thank you, Dr. Steve, for your very objective opinions on the program this morning. We appreciate you. Thank you. Well, this episode on Caribbean Political Uprising is available for you to re-watch it on our YouTube channel. Well, this is as much as time will permit for us on our current affairs-driven discussion this morning. We'll take a break and when we return, we'll turn our attention to ADBN Sports at 10, with the Super Eagles of Nigeria set for a showdown at the Godswell Akbar International Stadium in New York as they take on Libya to book a space in the 2025 AFCON competition. Stay with us.